So there we go, over to you, Ashley. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say thanks to Rob for inviting me here today. Um, he said to me he wanted me to come here for me to share my story with you about my use of the Moodle page over the last few years as a lecturer here in DCU. So just to sort of set the context about myself, as Rob said, I am a, an assistant professor on the Bachelor of Early Childhood Education um, program here in DCU, but I'm very much a newbie to DCU. I'm only here three years and um, it's not really reflected in my face as in my age. And the reason I wanted to sort of bring my age into this is that, you know, I want to really highlight to everyone is I am not a digital um, native. I am not a techie uh, queen by any shape or form. And actually I'm from the generation that was maybe brought kicking and screaming into the 21st um, century digital age. So in that way, I find myself constantly um, having to try and keep up to date with a rapidly changing digital environment. So I have to keep working on it and working with it. Um, so that sort of sets the context for me. So if I go back three years when I started with DCU, um, when I was given a module, I would be given a module descriptor with the learning outcomes and I would go and I would decide, right, what content do I need to get and deliver to my students so they can achieve their learning outcomes? And that's how I would structure, you know, how, how I was going to do it. And I would use PowerPoints in order to guide that type of presentation to the students. <clears throat> when it came to the Moodle page, I literally had um, no interest in it and I didn't really use it at all. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you and share with you my first ever Moodle page just to show you what I used to do um, with it. Bear with me now one second. So this was my first ever Moodle page. All I ever used to do was I put up my PowerPoint presentations, I put up some um, readings that might be relevant to the topic that I covered and the assessment folder there for students to be able to upload their assessments. You can see I had no interest in the design or the layout or anything else in relation to the, the Moodle page. But what happened around two years ago, I was approached by our team and we were asked if we would engage in developing a new masters for education in early childhood education. And I, along with my colleague, Marlene McCormick, were charged with developing a module in mentoring and leading for, for professional development. And because this was a part time master's degree, we decided it would be really good if we delivered this module um, online, like in a blended format. So mainly online with a little bit of face to face. But Marlene is a little bit older than me and neither of us had ever developed anything online and we had no idea what to do. So we went to our lovely teaching and learning enhancement unit and we asked them for help and support. So they helped us and I'm just going to show you here again. They guided us to the ABC workshop. So they said to us, look, if you want to design something online, why not take on this workshop? And we went to the ABC workshop. And I have to say, it actually transformed the way that I teach everything that I do. It really just transformed everything. Um, I suppose the starting point was where I said initially it was developing our learning outcomes. So defining our learning outcomes and then we'll build from there. There's a few takeaway things I wanted to take from the, the ABC workshop, and one of them was the tweet. They made us tweet our course. So you know why you're limited with the characters of a tweet. It really made you be very succinct. What is our course about? What is the purpose? What do we want to achieve? I thought that was a great takeaway, which I've applied in other circumstances. The next, again, another enlightening experience from the ABC workshop was the pedagogy first approach. So I had said earlier, I always went for content. What is it that the content that the students needed? But this really got us to look at six learning activities. And here's me again, not the digital native, but I now have those six cards and I carry them everywhere and they have informed every single module. I went back and restructured every single module based on those learning activities. And it wasn't that I wasn't doing different type of learning activities. What it was, was that I had been doing them, but you know, hadn't really structured it in. I hadn't planned, well, week one, I'm going to do this. Week two, I'm going to do that. But in this ABC workshop, they gave us that type of structure. And then they allowed us to storyboard it. So we literally took our module from week one all the way to week seven. We, inter we put in our learning activities and we structured it. And then, and only then did we go for content. So the storyboard gave us a visual for our module and allowed us to see how it flowed. And it was really, really effective in that way. Um, and then finally, which was a really nice part in it, what they did eventually, there was this other part where we had 
these circular um, sort of graphics and each learning activity, they had taken the suite of activities that you have on your Moodle page and linked them with a learning activity. So for the first time ever, I could see a rationale behind using some of these activities on the Moodle page and how it linked to the learning activity. So now I had a motivation to go back to that Moodle page and make it more interactive and really enhance the learning for my students. So that was the benefits that we gained from it, I have to say, like, you know, is really that it made me think about my teaching and it has transformed my teaching in a huge amount of ways. I work on an awful lot of different alternatives when I um, come to teaching and don't just rely on, on PowerPoint. It really enhanced the student learning. It made student learning more inclusive. And definitely I learned an awful lot about um, the universal design for learning. And one piece of advice that I would give is that when you go into the suite of the Moodle activities, it's, it can become overwhelming because there's so many of them. There really is so many of them. So what I decided to do is I took one activity at a time, per module, per semester. And I said, look, I'm going to try this out on this semester in this module, see how it works, conquer it, get good with this, and then we'll see if it's something I want to progress forward. So that's a really good way of sort of getting used to using these activities. So it's taking one step at a time. And then I'm going to finish off by showing you where my Moodle pages are now. Now, they're still a work in progress because I'm still working to get better on them. But here we are at the moment. So this was the module that we developed. And if you compare it to what I showed you earlier, you can see the difference. I've taken time in the design, in the layout. So even just the visual aspect of it, laying it out there. And when we come to the actual sessions, I took the ABC design approach. I loved the way that they would think about prepare, participate and expand. And it really helped me structure the content there for each of my sessions. And you can see there that I've used uh, one of the activities in the, the suite is for a page. Here I've used a H5P presentation. Here I've used an e-portfolio and here I've used a database. So you can see how, how I'm exploring exploring more and more activities in that way. So without further ado now, I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass you on to Matthew, who's going to give you a much better insight into the ABC workshop process. Uh, thanks so much, um, Ashling. I'm going to share my screen now too. You might give me the thumbs up there. You see a presentation, do you? Oh, hang on. All good, Matthew, thanks. And you got it there, yeah, great. So hi folks, my name is Matthew Waters. Um, I'm lead learning designer with DCU Studio. We're a very recently established unit in DCU, set up in August. Um, although most of the team have been with DCU for a while now. We are a team of learning designers, digital media designers, support officers, and project managers. And uh, Mairead Nicola Vahil is our head of unit. We basically, we work closely with academics to support the design, development and implementation of modules and programs. And I'm here to build on Ashling's overview and briefly look at ABC Learning Design as it relates to Moodle from the perspective of the learning designer. And I know not everybody is familiar with ABC. I'm seeing it come through the chat today, but hopefully there'll be a few little nuggets that I can share about it today that gives a sense of what it's about. Uh, basically, our approach to learning design is highly collaborative. We design and development. Uh, the, we design and develop the uh, the modules and the programs. Really, it's a partnership with academics such as Ashling. Our work would include the initial design all the way through to building the Moodle environment and developing out the multimedia resources. So, really, every bit of that kind of design and development pipeline, DCU Studio, we're there to support in a highly collaborative way. And basically, our model is built on regular weekly workshops or review meetings. And initially these will be a design workshop focused on ABC learning design. And really important part of the process is the storyboard as Ashley mentioned, and how we go from an initial understanding of ABC to designing and developing out those module activities in real detail. Um, the storyboard provides us with the roadmap, I guess, for the curation of the content and development of the module resources in Moodle. And we then set a set of, I suppose, agree a set of deliverables or homework nearly for the academics to complete, for ourselves to complete. And then we come back uh, regularly to review and look at the, the work as it emerges and as we build out those tangible resources in Moodle. Our design sessions then, as I said, are very discussion-based, they're very open. And we begin by building the understanding of what we mean by ABC learning design 
and the six ABC learning types, which describe the different ways that students learn. So if there's something, there's one takeaway about ABC, and if you're unfamiliar with it, I guess this slide's a really important one. It's the idea that students learn through acquisition, discussion, collaboration, investigation, practice, and production activities. And where possible, we should be trying to offer a variety of these activities for the students to engage with. We then, once we build that understanding, you know, amongst the team, we move quite quickly into exploring what kinds of activities and tools we might look to incorporate into the course. You can see on the screen there some of the activities and tools we would use in Moodle and how they might relate to the different ABC learning types. Uh, one of the great strengths of ABC is helping focus the discussion on how to enhance our asynchronous learning spaces, which are quite often neglected. For example, we often find the natural instinct is to include of a, a lot of acquisition types of activities, you know, very passive learning activities. So you might see a lot of journal articles, a lot of books, a lot of readings and so on. And it becomes very useful then to put them down on the page, on a storyboard, and to think about introducing a variety of, of alternative or, or additional activity types, such as practice or discussion, to build on those acquisition activities. And then, of course, this provides the students new opportunities or alternatives for developing and deepening their knowledge. So then, as we move through the design workshop, this all happens very quickly. It all happens over the course of a couple of hours, really. We move the storyboard where we identify the activities and tools which might work and where we start to look at the student journey through the module. So in that sense, ABC is very much student focused um, and we really start to think about what it is we're asking the students to do. Um, so basically in the context of ABC, we start to identify opportunities to introduce new ideas as well around how we take a detailed look at what we're asking the students to do and what the engagement with the, with the course looks like from a student perspective. You can see here in this example, we have a storyboard made on Miro where we break down the content into topics and consider the balance of content and activities then within those topics. And this storyboard shows the first five weeks of a module where the students are asked to watch instructional videos, complete practice activities, and participate in discussion activities in the form of uh, discussion forums before going into collaborate uh, in live lectures and tutorials. Another key conversation we have, of course, is looking at the assessment strategy, which is often related to production activity types. Considering how we will assess the students then gives rise to what formative activities we might think about introducing to scaffolding their preparation for assessment. In this case, you can see there are weekly practice quizzes which replicate the kind of questions the students will encounter in their summative assessments. Um, I guess in practice, I found the storyboard to be an absolute key output from the design stage and that one, like we review it and revisit it constantly throughout the development cycle. And it really is about informing and supporting discussion. The storyboard then becomes the roadmap for planning the development of the activities and content and creation in Moodle. Um, I know um, Ashton has already shown a couple of, of loop pages or Moodle pages, so I won't spend long on this, but it's just to show you then what it looks like very quickly when we develop the content into Moodle. We begin with a template that adheres to accessibility standards, which will be in common use across all of our pages. The content is chunked around topics or themes, quite often progressively released then within this tiles format that you can see. There are good links to supporting resources throughout the page, and we would always encourage our lecturers to post a profile picture and contact details, office hours, and so on, building that social connection with the students. Looking a little bit deeper then within the tiles, you see there are a variety of activities. These were all defined at that a initial ABC storyboarding exercise. And there's a nice balance of the ABC learning activity types as well. The expectations on the students are very clearly communicated with tasks, signposted, and where possible, we've, we've built in activity completion tracking so students know what they have to do at any given point. It can be seen here then that the activities in Moodle correspond to the storyboard I showed earlier, with students asked to acquire their knowledge through instructional videos, practice that knowledge through formative quizzes, discuss their understanding of the concepts, and then collaborating live lectures and tutorials. 
And I guess I'm going to start wrapping up, and uh, time is short as always, but just to leave it on some reflections of ABC from my perspective as a learning designer. Um, like Ashley, I'm not a DCU veteran. I've only been around for about a year, year or two months myself at this stage. Um, I, I actually hadn't encountered ABC before joining DCU, but I have to say it's become my go-to. And I find it to be a brilliant framework for discussion and collaboration, very much providing a shared conversational space and vocabulary between designers and academics. Um, I think it works so well because it's so simple. It's, it's, it's very easy concept to talk about, very easy to communicate. Uh, quite quickly, you can get to a shared understanding of what it is we're trying to do, and then quite quickly move into a design and development phase. Um, and it is very much a student support or student-centered uh, design process as we really start to step into the shoes of the student and look at what it is we're asking them to do. Uh, it's also a great resource because as we go through the design process, we start to document that design cycle and it does act as a resource when revisiting those designs in future iterations. It's a great starting place to review and reflect on what you might have done and think about iterating it uh, for the future. Um, it's very flexible and it's interesting then to see how different people apply it in different ways. The idea of mixing and remixing what the ABC is about is really, really important. We should all have, have a goal of kind of taking what we need from it. Um, so I guess it is very, very flexible. And one of the messages that, that I would really leave it on is, you know, feel free to adapt as you need. Find the bits that work. Uh, one of the great things about working with uh, and sharing experience in ABC and, you know, reflecting on the conversations we would have had with Ashley back in the earlier days is then seeing how that proliferation of practice in modules that we might, within the ECU studio, be directly engaged in from a learning design perspective. So we start to see the good practice moving around and spreading and, and bedding down in different ways. Um, and look, just to say, the ABC community is absolutely fantastic. There's loads of great resources online, very easy to find, and there's plenty of opportunities to participate in information sharing and so on. And so I'd encourage you really to have a look, have a go. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's what, like I said, it's, it's a very important tool in my toolkit at this point. Um, so I'll just say thanks very much and I'll stop sharing and hand it back to you, Rob. So thanks for listening to me, guys. And hand over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Roger Emery, Head of Learning Technologies at Solent University in Southampton, UK, and I'm just enjoying the storm just arriving here. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen, confirm that uh, you can see it OK. That would be helpful. Are you all OK? We can see my screen. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, Solent EMA, Electronic Management of Assessments, um, or Mark's Upload, as the project was known internally, um, this actually started, well, it's conversations around this started four or five years ago and the project proper started about three years ago. Um, and I must thank my colleague, um, who's I don't think on the chat today, but um, Sarah Cotton, who now works at Catalyst, who did um, the majority of the background work on this and along with some other colleagues who built process maps and, and so on. Um, so, um, First up, the question is, what's your VLE? Um, Moodle's not our VLE. Um, this is our VLE, um, with Moodle sat in the middle somewhere. Um, this is very high level um, diagram, but it just gives you an idea of all the bits of connections and those the black arrows are sort of data connections, as it were, maybe single sign on it, maybe data going from one place to another. Um, and you'll notice towards the top of that map, um, there's a box that says Mark's Upload, there's another one that says Assessment Dashboard, there's another one that says Quercus, which is our student record system. Um, so, so in amongst that, uh, that lot is, is what I'm going to be talking about today, um, but also turn it in sat there on the side. So wind the clock back three or four years, we had a strategic problem. Um, we had about 40,000 spreadsheets floating around collecting assessment result, results and resets. We're not a very big organization. So, you know, you can imagine how uh, much more entertaining that may be in a large university. Um, that obviously caused lots of duplication of effort, transposition errors. There was no real, I would say there was no standardized end-to-end -end process. Lots of people did their own things in their own way um, across the faculties and in different departments. You can imagine we end up with poor data quality. Um, I put assessment dates there particularly 
what was sat in our student record system and what was sat in front of the students on a PowerPoint or in a module guide or whatever may be different and sometimes was. Um, there was no single point of truth or there was the opportunity to uh, deviate from that single point of truth. There's obviously security and data protection risks there. If there's lots of spreadsheets, they get, uh, you know, digitally, as it were, left on the bus um, or wherever they, you know, the, the, the security issues there. A really inconsistent experience for students, um, multiple ways of getting feedback, getting their grades, knowing when they're going to get their grades, knowing when the deadlines are. Um, and also we had some other stuff, so external examiners, second markers, and also actually going out to employers or placement mentors and so on. How do they access? What do they see? So um, this slide kind of jumps ahead because this is some of the things we did as part of the project. So this is the end as well as the beginning um, of where we wanted to get to and, and actually where we got to. Um, but this shows some of our data flows um, between our record system and Moodle. Um, so just to explain how, how we do Moodle at Solent, we don't uh, roll over, as a lot of people say, or update modules. We have a brand new empty Moodle course page for every single instance of every single module. Um, so, and then lecturers can import their content um, and be responsible for its republication for another year. Um, so we pull in module instances to set up a shell page based on quite what is now quite a well-developed template. Um, we pull in student enrolments, so we get the students on the page. Um, we pull in the module leaders from our record system. Um, we then have some update tasks there, so if, if module dates change, etc., start and end dates, they get pulled in and updated. We then, and this was part of some of the project delivered, we pull in all the assessments, so that is automated. The assessment comes into Moodle, sets up a Moodle assignment activity with um, an ID, a name, the waiting, uh, the uh, due date on it, and a few other bits of data that sit in the background, ready for the lecturer to tick the final few boxes, i.e. is it a file submission, is it a video submission, is there a, you know, assessment brief to go with it. And then at the end of it, um, the data that goes the other way, um, we push the grades back into our student record system um, from Moodle. And in Moodle, if it was a box itself, um, we don't use the Turnitin activity, we use the Turnitin plagiarism plugin. Um, so that sits behind the Moodle assessment, um, sorry, assignment activity. Um, we did that quite a few years ago because of um, reliability concerns with Turnitin. So this meant that students could still submit their assignments on time, doesn't matter if Turnitin's working, and Moodle then sends the um, work off to Turnitin for its uh, matching score in the background. Um, if that job fails, it doesn't matter. The lecturer can still see the assignment, the work, mark it, the student can still upload. We also have a few downstream services. Um, we use the student app, we use the MyDay app. That then displace the students, their deadlines and when they're due. Um, and we've also got access for external examiners. Um, so some of the plugins I'm gonna talk about in the next 10 minutes somehow, um, cover some of these things. Part of the project, we built process maps. We were talking about ABC and uh, that's a process map, isn't it? We did lots of these. I think there's 15 or 20 of them floating around. I won't dwell on them, it was detailed. Um, so these are the plugins we actually um, use and have made use of and developed ourselves and some reports. So other than the standard assessment types like file and HTML text, um, we also have Mahara as an assessment type. We have uh, Medial um, to take video and audio, um, which is plugged in. It works like a YouTube clone really once you're in there. Um, we use the physical submission um, barcode plugin, which was developed um, funded by Coventry University and developed by Catalyst. Um, so we've been piloting that, but obviously with lockdown, there aren't many physical submissions. Um, we've developed a, very, a variety of uh, scheduled tasks. So to create the assessments, update the assessment, assessments, um, export the grades. Um, we've added some feedback types into there. So double marking, I won't call it full blind uh, feedback, but it is double marking. Um, the sample plugin, so um, uh, a particular assignment can be marked as a sample for viewing by an external examiner or others. Um, an academic misconduct uh, tick box. Um, it's only just a tick box, but it's still a plugin. So we've done this very granular. We've generated some user reports here. I call them user you know, um, reports. So there's a grade report which the external examiner can view and, and obviously the module leader where they can access the samples. Um, 
and an assessment dashboard for students and assessment dashboard for staff, both different, and I'll show you those. And then we've made reports and tons of reports. So we use the ad hoc query um, tool. Um, we may move this onto the newer report builder in Moodle. But you know, what assessments are due? Are there assessments with overrides, like people have got extenuating circumstances, so we've given them an extension. What group assignments, what are late, so our uh, um, student experience people can pick up late submissions and check the students are okay. Grades and feedbacks, have they been released? Is there late grading? Have we forgotten to grade something? Are there date errors? And so on and so forth. You can imagine the reports we can get out of all this data. So I'm just going to quickly spin through some of these plugins in a little more detail. So the, the scheduled task, um, that actually creates the assessment. So as I said before, it pulls a whole set of data as an XML across. It does this nightly um, and then actually triggers the functions that create the assess assignment activity to be created on the page. Um, there's a lot of checks in there. It only does it if there's a date in our record system. Um, it's got additional dates that are calculated. So our due dates, so if the assignment was due today, 7th of uh, December, it will then add seven days to generate the cutoff date, which is our late submission date. It then generates another date, which is the due date of the marking. So 20 working days, 28 approximate calendar days for the marking to be done. Um, there's a variety of Moodle assignment defaults, when I say defaults, they're the ones that you can set as an administrator um, that are set and locked so people can't change them. Um, you know, turn it in is turned on by default, for instance, and so on and so forth. Um, and the assignment due dates are shown to students, so we've done some tweaks on the um, interface to show students a little bit more data than the standard Moodle. Um, we've locked some fields, so the lecturers can't change the assignment name, they can't change the date, they can't change the ID number. If it's wrong in Moodle, back to the student record system, back through registry, change it at the point of truth. And then it's the up, update task then updates Moodle. Um, we've locked the grade scales, there's only two available. We've got a, a peculiar and interesting alphanumeric grade scale, as in A1, A2, B1, B2, etc., and also the 100% scale. Um, we use the released functions in the marking workflow so that once marking is completed, um, the uh, re releasing the grades releases it to the student record system and to the student so they can view it. Um, once that happens, grades are locked. People can't carry on editing grades past that point. Um, we've done some bits to the grading table to prevent pagination so you can see everything in one place. We actually display our internal student ID um, instead of the participant number when um, anonymous marking, blind marking is turned on. So what that means is that it's, it is anonymous at the point of marking, but it does help a lot if you have to de um, And it's no different to the paper cover sheets we used to have where students put their ID number. Um, we have also renamed the assignment tool formative assignment. So if anyone else wants to put an assignment in Moodle for any other reason, they can do, but it's called a formative assignment. So they know it is, and they know that anything that's graded in there um, won't go back into the student record system as a summative assignment. So people can still set up their own assignments, basically. Um, plugins, more of them, double marking. Um, on the right here, you can see where we've got a first grader, or get my pen to work, um, a first grade, second grade, and agreed grade that the module leader agrees, and then they set the marking workflow. So it's, it, it doesn't give the option for further commenting, but it does give at least um, where we are doing, um, you know, moderated grading that we can provide that. Um, there's the sample button. It's part of a sample, tick a box. That's all it does, but actually that's a really handy flag that we can then in our um, in other areas, other interfaces, so yes, it is a sample, and you can see how the double marking looks there. And if it's been referred to academic misconduct, well, we can tick that box and uh, flag that up to um, our academic misconduct people. So a lot of those like, things generate reports, and this is the grade report that we've done. So this is different to the grade book. Um, this is our own sort of grade report. And as you can see, the, when the external examiner logs in, they see, yes, it's a sample. So they can click on that, takes them straight to the assessment so they can view that assessment. So our external examiners have solent accounts to log in and look at these things. We can also print the report, obviously. I'm rushing through this because of time, so I can answer questions later. 
We've got a load of back-end schedule tasks that do complicated stuff, converts our alphanumeric grades back into an equivalent percentage um, so that our student record system will accept it. A um, whole load of logs to tell us what's happening, error logs, et cetera, et cetera, so we can see what's going on. Um, we've got other, as I said, tasks that update. So if things are wrong, if there's a, the assessment data has changed, that gets changed in one place, single point of truth. And then we have these uh, um, Moodle scheduled tasks that run to update that. And again, these run daily. I don't know when the screen captures are a bit old, but they run daily again to update data to pull down the newest uh, version of the data. So let's have a quick look at the uh, Moodle sort of assessment setup thing. As you can see, um, the allow submissions from is the day it was created, that is. But this date here, the due date, 17th of March, that's the one that's come from our student record system, which in turn generates the late submission, which in turn generates the remind me to grade. And I'll tell you why that's important in a moment. And then you can see further down here, we've got the academic misconduct button, we've got sample. So these things are defaulted turned on, but can be turned off if they need to be. Um, and also all of these other bits here, um, nothing's ticked here, but you can see we've got physical submission, depending on what you tick. Some of these things are locked down here. Um, so that people can't muck around with them. We found the biggest biggest issue we had was support calls with people pressing buttons they didn't know what they were doing with and then causing chaos. So we locked down as much as possible um, to how the university business expects things to run. Um, I'll just quick mention for the physical submission, as I said, Coventry uh, funded this, Catalyst built it. We've taken it and tweaked it a little bit further. Um, really handy for um, what we call base room submissions, where there's maybe art or, you know, 3D art or, or sculpture or fashion or something. Um, a barcode can be attached to a physical item and then the barcode is submitted with a normal scanner or even a camera phone um, into the Moodle assignment tool. And then it's the barcode that goes through the system, the barcode that gets marked. Barcode is the digital representation of that physical item. Worth having a look at that. It's, um, you know, if you have lots of physical or even performances or sport or whatever, um, everything can then be digitized as far as the marking process. I realize I'm nearly out of time. So just three more slides to go um, and I'll be done. So this is the assessment dashboard. This started out as a student feedback dashboard so they could find their feedback because everyone says, where's my feedback? And then expanded and got bigger and bigger. It's now on the main menu of our Moodle sort of, you know, top level menu. And as you can see, it shows the student their assignment, when it's due, when it was submitted, when it was graded. They can click directly in to get the feedback. Um, so if it's Turnitin feedback or a Moodle comment, or if it's in Medial or somewhere else, we've done the best we can to scrape the data and provide a link to go directly in it. It shows their indicative grade. There is a thing at the very top of this that says these are only indicative grades. They haven't been through the exam board, et cetera, et cetera. The other one we've got, and also I'll just say for students, it um, also gives them a dashboard of what's coming next. So they can plan and they can plan their next assessment and when they're doing it. Um, so they can see all their assessments past and future. We then sprung off, and this is quite a recent development. Staff said, oh, can we have one of those as well? We went, yes, you can. We'll do a slightly different one for staff. So it's just a report, basically, but it gives you the assignment. You can link straight to it, the due date, but it gives you the grading date. When have I got to grade this thing? What, what submission? How many submissions? How many drafts? Um, are my grades released on time? Well, these were late. I'm not sure why, but I don't want to <laughs> shame anyone. But it also rags it. So if there's late grades, I mean, these are these ones here, um, the resets or something that weren't used, but it lights up red if something's late. If something is in a state of they've been handed in and you're within your 20 days of grading, it sits there as amber. So it gives people traffic lights as to what they need to do as staff. So a sort of flip side to the student dashboard. Two of the most popular pages on our system now, um, particularly the student one. So just to end, what have we done? We flushed out lots of bad data. The data's public. People complain the data's bad, it gets fixed. Um, it's improved data elsewhere because of the amount of reports we've got, we can see where there's a problem elsewhere. Um, it's supported the end-to-end -end marking process, streamlined a lot of stuff, really formalised processes, some of which were honestly in people's heads or just the way things were done or it was institutional knowledge, it's had to be written down. Um, we can monitor bunching of stuff, we can send data in now for engagement monitoring, so if there's a 
for, for instance, one of the ones is late submissions, all the late submissions, there's a report that our student achievement officers can pick up, they can email the students and say, is everything okay, you've still got seven days to submit your assignment. So that, you know, it, it knocks on the student experience there. We've deleted some processes, we even won an award for this, um, for, you know, continuous improvement. Um, and also environmental, we've got rid of all those bloody carbon cover sheets we had with three bits of paper that went everywhere, um, down to the barcode, and there's some efficiency savings um, uh, that we've got for different parts of this. was the start of the project, this goes back for the, to the pilot, so we've seen a fair bit of efficiency and, and more since. So there you go, we've got a wish list of what we want to do next, um, do other things, marking quizzes, marking forums, marking other activities, can we apply it in there? Um, and I, I know my colleague Mark is uh, is on the call and he's probably horrified at the amount of other things we could do with this while he's trying to learn how this works. So um, I'll leave that page up and, and take questions now. I realise we've run over loads to go through, um, but there's the GitHub link if anyone wants to look at it. We can't support you using this, but you're quite welcome to go and look at the code, pull down the plugins, experiment them with them on your development servers and, uh, and have a go. But a lot of it is quite solent. Uh, I'll end there and take questions. I'm sorry for overrunning a little bit.